Hi folks, this is being recorded on Monday, December 7th. And I just want to repeat that we're going to take a vacation and liberate you during the holidays from my mumbles. And we will resume the regular sessions on the second Monday in January, which I believe is January 11th. So there are millions of things to potentially talk about. Um, China, Africa, Middle East, uh, Belarus, and Azerbaijan, all kinds of things. But because it's the sort of last session of the, of the year, I want to sort of um, talk more broadly about things, and then we can resume the special topics in the new year again. So let me start uh, with Biden's announcement that we are back and I want to deconstruct what he says and what meanings one can attribute to it. So the first thing of course in we are back is the we and the we that is returning under Biden to the international scene is a very different we than a few years ago. Uh, the obvious internal mess in the United States uh, the refusal of the president to acknowledge the election has been won. Uh, the general uh, disaster of COVID, which is as serious in the world as any, any country, and which, of course, amazes people about us that we, the supposedly technologically most advanced country, and this, that, and the other thing, are the ones where people are dying like flies. Uh, Dean Gutter reminded me that today is also Pearl Harbor Day, and about 2,400 people died at Pearl Harbor, both civilians and military. And we've had quite a few days this year, including the last few days, when more than 2,400 Americans have died from COVID. Uh, this is shocking, extraordinary, sad, but it also is part of who the we are right now. Uh, we, we are in many ways a transformed country. And it isn't that the world has been naive about the US. I mean, people have known about, you know, race issues in the United States. Uh, people have known about um, the difficulty of, uh, or the un unraveling of American climate rules under Trump. Uh, people who read the newspaper and stay on top of things have not had an idealized notion about the US. But nevertheless, we were considered to be the role model of many things. Um, the role model for, <coughs> excuse me, the role model for uh, the economy, the role model for human rights, the role model for democracy. Um, and also we have been, or the rest of the world has been accustomed to us preaching to the rest of the world. Uh, let me just quickly say that um, the kind of election we've just had and the fact that we have an autocrat in the White House who refuses to acknowledge that he has lost is the kind of politics which has happened in quite a few other countries around the world over the years. And we, the United States, would go help intervene in those countries and try to uh, put pressure on whoever the autocrat was to in fact leave office and have the rightful elected person take office. And we have over the years through the Carter Center and other mechanisms tried to help people have honest elections uh, because we knew how to have honest elections and we were a society that accepted by and large accurate and honest election cons. So it's not just that we now believe, be, begin to look, the we in us, begin to look some, like some two-part dictatorships with an authoritarian head of state uh, who still to this day argues that he will be back. But uh, we are uh, 
diminished. That is to say, the we that others look at us are, have been seriously diminished domestically because we preach one thing and we seem to practice another thing. Or even if we don't seem to succumb to another thing, um, for example, an autocratic government and elect a Democrat, namely uh, and, and a small D Democrat and large D Democrat like Biden, uh, Biden is now in a position to represent a country where the we as we Americans think about ourselves, as well as the we that the rest of the world thinks about ourselves, has been fundamentally transformed. And the implications of this are just super serious uh, for the United States and the role the United States could be. We have lost the high moral ground, essentially. And um, it will be very difficult to reclaim it. I mean, take something like human rights. We were at the forefront during the Cold War, after the Cold War, of not only making the rules for human rights in the world, but also preaching it and criticizing other countries for violating human rights, right? And then under the Trump administration, you see what has happened in our borders, uh, the separation of children, the treatment from their parents, the treatment of immigrants in general. Uh, this has produced a different we, both in the eyes of ourselves and uh, as well as in the eyes of the rest of the world. In addition, um, what is shocking about the we is admittedly Biden has won the election, but as you very well know, that just short of half of the American public are on Trump's side, they're Trump people. Who, who to this day claim that they don't uh, believe that Biden won. And the silence of our legislature, our Republican uh, senators, on, most of them on this issue. So that um, the idea that um, we are now, the we will now be, you know, the stable, useful, democratic society that we're all gotten adjusted to with all of its flaws, we ourselves now look very different politically. We have a huge schism in this country. And as most observers that you've probably read or heard have pointed out, uh, the Trump phenomenon is not about to disappear when Biden takes over as president. So that it's not just our policies, it's not just our hypocrisies, it is the fact that structurally we are now a different country. Now this didn't happen overnight, admittedly. That is to say the alienation and the hostility of some people in the, our fellow citizens and their willingness to support somebody like Trump, both in his policies and in his person to get reelected, um, that may be new in its extreme form, but we've been slithering into this uh, for some time. So the reckoning of the we for external policy, which I wanna talk about in a minute, as well as for ourselves as to who we actually are, I think has now been fundamentally transformed. And while I'm not such a pessimist to say it can never be rectified, it will take years, if not decades, to rectify and or continue to be a problem and to make it worse. So it's so easy to say we, but the we are not the we of yesterday. And I think we, as citizens, we need to confront that and the world looking at us uh, is not only confronting it, but is now acknowledging it. Then the part, the other part of the sentence, we are back, what Biden of course means by we are back is we're going to rejoin the world, right? We're going to get back into the Paris climate change. We'll get back to World Health Organization. We might stop our destructive behavior in the World Trade Organization and try to get that back on track, uh, we might, uh, you know, play a more constructive role in other international institutions of one kind or another. And, and also we will continue, for example, NATO, uh, also we will value our alliances again 
and try to be in a constructive, cooperative reliance with, let's say, the European Union, but also bilaterally, Germany and France and all those countries and all those leaders that we have insulted and or not even consulted when you, we used to consult them about joint policy. Uh, all that is going to be on a new track. And there, I think there's some positive news in the sense that, yes, um, you know, uh, Biden will have congenial telephone calls with opposite numbers. He's not going to insult uh, Merkel. Uh, he will try to uh, be constructive in various issues, including regional uh, climate issues, regional ways of dealing with uh, COVID and so forth. So there is something to be said that leaders in other countries, other parts of the world, buy into the back part of the we are back. That is to say, we will now have a return to a better operation and cooperation with other institutions and other, uh, other countries. Now, even having said this, and this is a positive, will be a positive development, there's another side to this. And that is that the way we transact business with other institutions, with uh, other bureaucracies, with the security networks, with our allies in Europe and so forth, is dependent on having a functioning government of our own. And part of the problem of that is that many departments of government have been destroyed or undermined during the Trump administration. I've talked about this before. The uh, State Department has been decimated. Uh, the security agencies are now headed by total turkey birds who know nothing about security, and some of them are actually right-wing extremist uh, individuals. Uh, that is to say, Trump has over the four years, as well as during the last few weeks, is trying to dismantle the competency of many of the agencies which have to implement and coordinate the policies that Biden wants to return to in terms of we are, will be better allies and more participatory and, and so forth. So even there to say, uh, you know, we're back, the back part is going to take some time until it gets smoothened out and rebuilt. I have mentioned over and over again the State Department. The State Department has been decimate, decimated. By the way, I misspoke the other day and said there are more people speaking some European language I think I said uh, Hungarian or something, then there are people who speak uh, Chinese and Arabic. It's actually more people right now in the State Department speak Portuguese rather than Arabic or Chinese. Um, that's a problem, but that's not the only problem. Many of the competent foreign service officers uh, have retired, early retired, have left. Uh, the morale in that institution is abysmal, but it's also abysmal in many other uh, the departments of government, because uh, in the last decades, almost all departments of the U.S. government have an international division, whether it's agriculture or labor. Uh, it's not just the State Department. It's not just the National Security Council. It's many departments of government which liaison with their opposite numbers in other countries to coordinate and to cooperate. So to say, yeah, well, I'm now going to make telephone calls and be on friendly terms with the leaders that have been alienated is absolutely necessary, but it's not sufficient because it will take months, if not years, to rebuild the competency of the U.S. government in its capacity to transact policies and coordination and alliances with other countries. And I think that hasn't really been talked enough about because everybody is so delighted that, you know, there will now be Biden outreach again to the rest of the world. Yes, well, Biden himself and his competent international politics uh, uh, appointees, most of whom I think will probably pass the Senate, but some may not, you probably read about that, 
uh, the Republican Senate will throw as many monkey wrenches into the uh, appointments of the Biden administration that need uh, Senate approval. So unless the two Democratic senators are elected in Georgia, uh, Biden may not have an interest in easy time getting all these people appointed. But put that quite aside, we can talk more about that in January and February. Uh, the fact of the matter is that whoever is in charge of the various departments of government, um, even very experienced, knowledgeable people like Tony Blinken, will have a hell of a time, and it will take a long time, to attract very competent and able people back into the U.S. government to do what Biden would like to do. Now, there's a flip side to all of this, and the flip side is that while we have been out to lunch during the Trump administration, the role that the U.S. was able to play in some of these institutions that it no longer had any interest in and or left has had the vacuums created by the U.S. have actually been filled. I mean, we can just imagine that by the U.S. leaving an international institution, the institution is now has this big hole where the U.S. used to be at the forefront of making policies, of funding, and, and all the rest. No, no, no. The dynamic has changed. And the dynamic has, would have changed even if it had not been for the Trump administration because of the new role that China is playing. And we'll have to talk more about China in, in the, the new year. Um, but China... Um, etched itself into more important roles in various international institutions and fora. Uh, first, because it decided to play a more activist role, because China used to not play a very activist role at all during the years when it was focused on internal affairs and had less of an international outreach, right? And now we know that China is busy in all parts of the world, in our backyard, in Central America, in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, everywhere. China is just all over the place. And it's all over the place with technical assistance and people and construction projects and loans and assistance and help now with the, with the COVID disaster and so forth. So China has taken advantage of the vacuum created by the United States to play a much more prominent role in these international institutions. And when the US arrives, meaning when the Biden is the same institutions and we're not back in the same roles that we enjoyed before all this Trump business went, went down. So the US will not be in a position to be the dominant and lead country in the international system, which it was used to being uh, pre-Trump. Now, it, we need to be honest and say that the Obama administration also wanted to um, roll back the U.S. role in international affairs in some ways and play less of a domineering role. But it, the, the rollback of the U.S. role in the world was minor during the Obama administration compared to the current um, uh, Trump administration and what it has done and not done in international institutions. So being back, I think, will be welcomed, certainly by our allies in Europe, may be welcomed by many others, but, you know, the chair and the place at the table will be smaller, and it will require a different attitude on the part of the United States, not saying now we're back and now we're in control again, but rather now we're back and we want to play a constructive, we want to play a constructive role. Um, and now, um, while Trump is still in power, of course, he is making the we are back more difficult by the day. Uh, for example, um, the recognition of, uh, not the recognition, I'm sorry, the uh, killing of the Iranian scientist uh, by everybody agrees, the Israelis, was of course somewhat coordinated with the United States. I mean, Secretary of State Pompeo went over to Israel, they chatted, they did that, the other thing, and very few days later, 
uh, that scientist gets gets killed. Uh, that is, of course, not the first assassination that the Israelis have undertaken in Iran. And whatever one thinks about that, or whatever one thinks about Iran, which I also want to talk more about in the new year, uh, whatever one thinks about Iran, uh, the fact is that Israel having um, assassinated the scientists means an English translation that he has queered things for the Biden administration to try to move forward in a more constructive lane with respect to Iran. So in a sense, what uh, Netanyahu has done is what Trump is doing, saying let's make life as difficult as possible for the Biden administration. And any chance for the Biden administration to renegotiate the uh, nuclear agreement with Iran and to deal with the Iran, Iran, which will desire and insist on getting some of the sanctions removed and so on, has been made vastly more complex by what uh, the uh, Israelis have just done in, in uh, assassination. And in point of fact, there's a larger issue here, which is, and you will recall, the U.S. assassinated the, the Iranian general in Iraq, is that the whole idea of assassinating opposition leaders is something which the Biden administration ought to seriously uh, question. I mean, it is one thing to get rid of... Um, uh, you know, various terrorist leaders of terrorist organizations. It's another thing to get rid of people who are part of somebody else's government, right? And that is a very bad road to be traveling down on. And it's a road that Netanyahu has welcomed, uh, uh, Trump administration has welcomed, and that needs to be, uh, that needs to be re reconsidered. Um, the other part of the Trump situation, which Biden will inherit, uh, which also means we can't be back so easily, is of course the whole COVID mess. A, the COVID mess in the United States, and it's incredibly poor handling, uh, which has led us down to this road of our still increasing death, hospital shortages and all the rest. Uh, that too reflects on the we part because the assumption was that the American establishment was second to none in the world. And while it may be second to none in organ transplant and other uh, very complex situations, uh, more or less the world knows that we're the only industrial country that does not have universal health care. And even though Biden is going back to talking about, you know, expanding Obamacare and all the rest, whether he can get it through Congress or not is another issue. Um, the fact that we have a dysfunctional CDC, which used to be considered the best CDC in the world. The fact that we have this incredible mess on our hands in terms of doctor shortage, hospital shortages, bed shortages, equipment shortages, and all the rest has not been lost on the rest of the world. So the incompetence, not just bad policies, but the incompetence of the Trump administration will be very difficult to reverse because it will require tons of money and a restructuring of the American medical system, uh, universal health care, and all the rest. And uh, people overseas can be forgiven for thinking that this is going to be very difficult for Biden, for Biden to, uh, to change. Now, let me move to something more positive. And that is irrespective of Trump and his appalling policies and his autocratic behavior and the election outcome and the COVID disasters in the United States and the very dominant role that China is playing in the world, including on COVID. I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, one of the good things that has emerged is the globalization and the acknowledgement of globalization of so much of the research uh, that has gone into and will continue to go into the whole uh, pandemic. As badly as the US has handled 
uh, our domestic situation. And as unprepared as many parts of the world were for the COVID crisis, what is astounding, and I talked a little bit about that in the last one, is the degree to which the physical sciences, the laboratories, the physicians, the researchers have cooperated across the globe. And so while so much populism and nationalism has been going on, including in the United States, we shouldn't forget the positives of this. And the positives of this is that globalization in many ways is alive and well and is not destruct necessarily destructive. It is one thing to talk about fake news. It is another thing to talk about Facebook and other uh, media outlets, which are not monitored carefully, have allowed all kinds of conspiracy people to broadcast their news. And um, there is a uh, policies afoot as we speak in Germany to rein in some of the tech companies and there's much to be said about all of that. But there's also much to be said about the fact that globalization has, in many ways, in terms of research and information and knowledge and development of vaccines, has really worked. And it is astounding what has happened and how quickly this has all happened. I mentioned last time that the heads of most of the uh, uh, tech firms that have uh, research uh, firms that have done medical research have, are actually headed by, uh, by immigrants in various countries, including Pfizer. I misspoke last time, the head of Pfizer is of Greek origin. And so much for immigrant bashing. It's also the case that uh, immigrants are uh, doctors are all over the United States. If it weren't for the many immigrant doctors, we would be in worse shape. Uh, so the whole immigration issue uh, and how globalization has in fact helped because of immigration in various countries needs to be noted. Now, the appalling American immigration policy is presumably something that Biden can address and hopefully will address. And the United States is not the only country that needs to worry about what to do about the movement of people in the world. I've talked in the past about the degree to which climate change will make that worse and one has to think about what to do about it all. But um, I, on the positive side, it is amazing that in spite of the US, in spite of Trump, in spite of national obstacles, uh, the research around the world on COVID and even the movement of equipment and now the movement of virus uh, vaccinations uh, has been a, an astounding success so far. And you can tell that even the most industrial countries are dependent on some of this globalization. For example, you probably heard in the news that uh, England will be the first country to use Pfizer vaccines, and I think they're starting today or tomorrow. Well, the vaccines that, uh, the Pfizer vaccines that will be used in England are in fact produced in a small town in Belgium, right? So here again, you can see that the national bond boundaries, which right-wingers and populists are focusing on, and the nationalism that has been come back into fashion. Nevertheless, on top of all that, or perhaps underneath all of that, you have all kinds of fairly constructive globalization going on, which is making things markedly, markedly better. And that actually is also a hopeful sign in terms of we're back um, in uh, of the of the Biden. Uh, policies uh, with respect to climate change, because climate change is both a local issue and Biden administration will presumably undo all the rules, cancellation of rules that Trump did for American domestic environmental protection, right? Uh, all the pollutants that are going back into rivers and lakes because Trump got rid of Obama's regulations on those things. Well, Biden can put the, many of those back. 
But uh, the truth of the matter is that quite aside from what countries can do and need to do domestically, there is very much a global component. And one is seen in the creation of research for COVID that at some levels, very high levels in terms of research and sharing information, things can be done internationally. And that, uh, you know, there is a case to be made that what uh, the COVID research, the vaccine research, the cooperation among scientists could be a less object lesson for what can and needs to be done uh, globally in terms of environmental uh, matters, climate change, and also in terms of finding some kind of international policies, structures in which to deal with the movement of people because of climate change, because of economic downturns and other things. So I want to end on a hopeful note, namely, yes, the U.S. is not returning uh, as the you know as it was before, it now has to reconcile itself that it will play a much more modest role. It can play a constructive role. It's still one of the richest countries in the world. It still has a lot of technological capacity. Biden can generate more goodwill. At least our allies will be very happy to have us back. But even they have had to rely a little bit on their on themselves. Uh, Macron and France, for example, uh, you know, if NATO doesn't work out, he says, let's have a European, European Union security pact and so forth. So that even our best allies have, have tried to take up the reins that were dropped by the Trump administration. Now, partially those reins can be re picked up again. And in that sense, Biden is right. But I would counsel that it's only partial and that in many ways, uh, we will have to play a more modest role in international affairs in the, in the Biden years. And we will have to work very hard to rebuild our capacities to in fact play a constructive role again in world affairs. So while we are back is certainly a welcome phrase, I just wanted to complicate it a little bit because it's too simple if we just think, oh, okay, so now Trump will be gone and we will domestically and internationally be back to square one. We're not back to square one, but we certainly will be on a better track. So with that optimistic ending, I wish you all a good holidays, try to stay safe, enjoy our beautiful environment, and I'll see you in January.